are ready to get started again, and I'll give it another minute or so um, while people are making it back into the room. If you can start making your way back to your seats and we'll get started with the next point on the agenda. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed uh, the uh, tours in the Ericsson studio. For the next session, we're going to turn to an industry that is undergoing some uh, undergoing tremendous transformation, the TV and media industry. You probably know that, uh, or might not know, that Ericsson has been uh, quite active over the last couple of years to establish a position in this industry. We have made some significant acquisitions over the past years, including acquiring Media Room from Microsoft, we've acquired Redbee, um, Technicolor, and most recently Fabrix, uh, which is a set-top box in the cloud service. Our presence in television today includes the management of services uh, for millions of subscribers. We actually run the play out services for some 500 TV channels. In fact, if you're in Europe and watching TV, most likely it's run by Ericsson. Some 500 channels, including 150 over the top uh, players that we run this for. We have some 5,000 staff working within TV and media, and we actually have won five Emmy Awards as well. For, uh, for our services. This is a very important area with tremendous development, a lot going on, and therefore I'm very, very happy to invite our next speaker. Uh, she has a solid background as a journalist, both within print and uh, above all in broadcast. Uh, she is the long-time CEO of the Swedish national TV, Sveriges Television, who are I'm sure uh, we're going to hear about the tremendous transformation journey that they are embarking on. Please welcome Eva Hamilton. Hello everybody. And uh, did you come today, this morning or last night? So you really picked your time to visit Stockholm, the best of Weather, so I advise you to come back in May or in June or in July or in September or something. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, it's nice to be with colleagues. Uh, as I was introduced, I was a journalist for almost 30 years before I became head of news, and then later on I was a correspondent and so on, I became head of news, and then today I'm the CEO of Swedish Television. Do I have a, um, I would like some kind of, you know, <laughs> being able to switch my pictures here. I point. Next, fine, okay. So, um, everybody knows about BBC, raise your hand. <laughs> 
I would like to say that Swedish television is the small sister of BBC. I mean, we have the same kind of organization, the same kind of uh, remit, and the same kind of uh, relation, quite independent to the sitting government and sitting parliament. So this is SVT. Uh, it's a public service company. It is financed by a license fee of 230 euros a year, and everybody has to pay, or every household has to pay, who has a TV set. So if you have a TV set, it's compulsory, you have to pay your license. We broadcast 23,000 hours a year in four different channels. This was a former monopoly, only like 25 years ago, there was only one Swedish television, and that was SVT. Today, or this is a picture we composed year 2000, because that was the year when the terrestrial nets were digitalized, and an average household in Sweden all of a sudden could receive up to 23 channels, and if they bought a satellite, of course, they could get even more. But an average household had 23 hours in the year 2000. If I would make this picture today, it would be even more cluttered, of course, because there are so many TV channels to be reached in, in Sweden. But today, I am going to um, introduce to you, uh, these are the traditional channels, and uh, they are the SVT1, which is the main family, mainstream channel, SVT2, cultural documentary, character affairs channel. We have the uh, children's channel, the pink one, SVTB, and we have the uh, world service and so on. But I'm not going to talk to you about the traditional TV channels because um, TV in a modern sense is so much more. TV is all over the place. TV, you might call it streaming video, you might call it non-linear, you might call it digital TV, and it's all about the old TV experience. It's all still about sharing feelings, experiences, and knowledge in a constant stream of moving pictures. And there is no newspaper today with any hope of survival that does not publish itself in video. May it be La Stampa in Italy, or the Swedish tabloid, Aftonbladet, or whatever newspaper in the developed world that you choose. And there is also the fast-growing subscription film and TV series provided Netflix, as well as the giant among youngsters, YouTube. More about them later. So, how do we cope at SVT with this new reality? To your left, you have the traditional liner TV channels, the FD1, the 2, the world, the children, and so on. To your right, you have the new world. Uh, and we have, as I guess many of you, we have to use the very same money that we entirely used for the left side yesterday, we have to use the very same money to expand to also cover the right side today, which is a very hard question of prioritizing all the time. But what you see to your right here is um, the uh, player, the green arrow there. You have the uh, news and the SVT online. And then you have all the, what should I call it? Channels, packages. Bundlers, what is the new name of the services that we provide online? You have the children's channel, the light blue square thing there, online. You have the Flow, which is a channel with many different kind of programs in it, dedicated to younger women. It's kind of a niche channel, but on the internet. You have the news, of course. You have the Open Archive, which is a long tail um, offered with programs that are older than, what, 10 years? You have the Sport, a big package or a channel on the internet. You have the Toddlers programs, Bully Bumpa. And then under the dotted line, uh, how should you describe them? That's not channels, that's not a single program, but it's a kind of a package where we 
kind of, of um, try to make an entity of different programs for the teens, you see the blue square there, I think, for the documentaries, for knowledge, the red square, and some TID, which is something that is to come next year, which is a very exciting interactive platform for different cultural activities where we invite the audience to come to us and help us create content as well as we start chats or we start uh, different experiments together with the audience. Uh, is that a channel? Is that a program? What the heck is it? So, this world that we are quickly trying to transform to, there was one very early, early warning, that was the news. And you know, every traditional TV or media company, news is one of the bases. I mean, it's really something that you rely on. And for public service company, news are the core. So quite early, we began to see that the audience watching the daily news was quite an old audience. In 2008, we saw that more than half had turned 60 or more. And you see, this is coming very, very quickly. So now, 2013, last year, more than 61% of the audience is older than 60, as I've written here. I would even rather say 64, the average age of the audience of our daily news show is 64. My own father is 93, and I mean, he's still vital in his head, but his body is so tired. So he sleeps like 18 hours a day. But you're sure that at 7.30, when the main news show goes on, he pops up on his bed and he goes, sits in his chair with this special thing for so he can hear, and he watches the daily news. And by the weather forecast, he starts to you know, get very tired and goes back to bed. But the daily news is a habit. It's a routine. It's something that is a part of your daily life. And today we see, and we saw quite early, that this pattern is changing. That was the first early warning of that something big was happening. Another early warning comes from the to toddlers. They are first generation of parents that are native. Parents that were born into internet. Parents that had never experienced anything than a world with internet. A toddler in Sweden has access to a tablet, to an iPad normally. 75% of the toddlers have access to tablets. I have a grandchild, small like this, one and a half year old. He knows exactly where to put his little finger on the arrow to start the video. A two-year-old in Sweden is on internet, all, or every two, or forty-eight percent of the two-year-olds are on internet every day. Internet has become the new book, or the old television, or the new toy, or a tool. And when you turn five, you're already a very, very qualified internet user. The normal five-year-old kid uses three hours a day with some type of screen. Also in school, I mean, iPads in school or in daycare centers have become something very ordinary. So when did we start? to transform this old public service company being a monopoly for so long and then getting the competition from all the new TV companies and then coming so strongly internet. In 96, we started our first quite primitive player. You could um, find the news there. That was just about it. We didn't have the rights. The, the um, IP rights, the intellectual property rights, to um, offer anything else but the news. I mean, the word of rights is something that should never be underestimated as a blocker of what's happening. The right is the rights are something that is really not up to date. 
Anyway, so we started uh, offering the news on this very new player in 1990, in 2000, sorry, 2006, sorry, 2006 uh, was the first player introduced. It's so very soon, it was a very popular service. It was easy, it was easy to understand and it was very easy to navigate. So it was a quick pick up in the popularity and you can see already 2013 that 26 percent of the Swedish population regularly used the player every week. And now we're up to 27 and I would say we are going up to 30 every week and if you talk about the month uh, then we are up to like 50, 60 percent. And again if you talk about my own father, 93 years old, he knows exactly how to use the player. So um, the player is also I mean, that's a very easy way of getting video, moving pictures. And we know, I know, and you know, that there's no better way of uh, asking people to pay for broadband access. Moving pictures is the, and the Swedish television's player is one of the main reasons why Sweden is the most broadband penetrated country in the world, next to the Netherlands. Uh, we just counted here before coming up on stage here, I think like 95% of the Swedes, 95% of the Swedes had access to internet. Not all of them is speedy access, but they do have access. And I would say that the SVT play is one of the major reasons which is very fast broadband expansion. Uh, what do you see also, and this is a quite an interesting picture, I mean under here you have total, your men, women, 9 to 15 years, I mean, you, have, you have ages there, young adults, uh, parents of small children and so on, there are different ways to classify the audience. What you see here that even if Sweden is so broadband penetrated, even if the player is such a popular uh, device, you see still that the television, the old traditional te television, is still a very strong media. Out of a total of 90% uh, of the suites in a week using SVT, and we have all kinds of devices and services apart from television, uh, 83% mainly use television and the additional audience that come that we wouldn't have if we didn't have if we couldn't uh, offer the other services are only 87%. So I mean the core audience is still television. So the adding audience that we get only thanks to our new devices to our new services it's only on the total of 7%. And then you see if you're younger, if you're like between 16 and 19, it's, we get an extra part of the audience thanks to our new uh, services that is up to, what, 50%. So you're younger you are, the younger you get, the more you use, I and mean, that's no news to you. But it's, what I'm so interesting with this picture is it shows quite clearly how strong the old traditional TV still is. YouTube is the phenomenon. Um, Eighty percent of the traffic to YouTube comes from outside the US. It's the biggest streaming platform in the world and hundred hours of streaming videos is uploaded every minute. Seventy-four seven every minute in the week you get an extra 800 hours per minute I mean it's uh, it's hard to to understand it's hard to to grasp I visited and now you're going to see my very amateurish pictures here I took them with my mobile phone and I didn't put much time in you know as you can see it's gone in it's, this is the small entrance of Maker Studios and Maker Studios is in Los Angeles I was there last week it's a modest, grey, storage look-alike building far from the romantics of Hollywood. Disney paid half a billion dollars for this company only in February this year. And 
Maybe Studios is intended to help talent, all those who contribute with content to YouTube to create, distribute, and monetize their material. 400 people work here constantly, and they are systematically screening, searching YouTube for content that has a good potential to reach more viewers. So there's now a network with like 50,000 people from all over the world active on YouTube who have been approached by Maker Studios and they have now been invited to be a part of the network. And what Maker Studios can do is to help all these people, all these youngsters and private persons all over the world, to help them to um, raise the quality of their content, but also reach many more viewers. So what these students at Maker Studios do right now, right here, they're actually screening YouTube to see what, what the person here has more than 800 viewers, more than 800 followers. Hmm, here's somebody with 803. Let's see. Hmm, the content has a potential. It's not very good yet, but it has a potential. And then Maker Studios help that person to bundle the material with other who has the same kind of material, to monetize it through Google Ads so they get some kind of payment, and to give them advice. Who are your viewers? In what country do they live? At what time do, you, do they enter YouTube to see your material in order to help them raise their, their number of viewers from like 800 to millions? And of course, maybe studios get a payment via the ads that all those content providers then can publish. Uh, what Maker Studios also has is Studios themselves. It's a kind of production company. They help the most talented of the contributors of, of uh, content to help produce their, their, their stuff for YouTube. So it reaches a better quality. YouTube is today the big source of talent also for a very traditional TV maker as SVT. Down in the, in the corner here, Pewdie, PewDiePie, that's a really, I mean, take a look at that. That is YouTube's absolutely most followed man. 30 million people follow him every day. 30 million. PewDiePie is a Swede. He lives in uh, Great Britain right now. And he was a gamer. I mean, he spent his childhood gaming and his parents were frustrated and sad and desperate. At the time, he understood that he could put the camera on his screen and start filming himself while playing. And today, he is followed by a young man playing, and he is a multimillionaire, and he is the greatest source of viewers in, at YouTube. He's an artist. The others are young Swedish artists that we have found via YouTube and we have offered them regular TV programs. And they have become big stars, both in the young audience to, to YouTube, but also in the more established audience to TV. Netflix, another phenomenon, came to Sweden only in autumn 2012. And there was a weekly reach of 3%. It was quite a small one. And it grew in such a space. space. So right now, 40% of, there has, they have a weekly reach in the audience of the entire screen of 40%. This is spring 2014. And now they are coming into Switzerland, Austria, France, Germany, Belgium, 